and welcome to Radiation Lesson 5, Induced Fission. When we talk about uranium, it often sounds quite dangerous. We think of atomic bombs and uh, nuclear power plants melting down, Chernobyl. Words like this come to mind. It turns out that if you just leave uranium around, it isn't that exciting. Uranium-238, which is the most common isotope, and uranium-235, the isotope that is used in both atomic bombs and in nuclear power stations, are both extremely stable. They have half-lives of about three quarters of a million years, so 750,000 years. You can leave a lump of uranium next to your bed, and you will be fine especially if it's small, which we'll get to in a moment. Uranium just kind of sits there. It's chill. However, uranium-235 has a really special thing going on with it, which is rather than just waiting for the half-life to do its thing, 750,000 years, flip a coin, see if it decays, if a neutron ever smacks into a uranium nucleus, it will undergo induced fission. To induce something means to make it happen. So inducing fission is when fission, rather than just happening because of the half-life, happening because the particle has been around for long enough and just wants to give up on life, instead we're going to make that fission happen. And this is how we do it. If we smack one neutron into a uranium, then we can create these three things. Beryllium, krypton, and crucially, three more neutrons. And this is where things start to get interesting. Now you know from your Rutherford scattering and your model of the atom, that most of an atom is empty space. So if you just had a tiny lump of uranium and a neutron happened to smack into one of these uraniums, it would break up and those three neutrons would go flying through your block of uranium. And it would be unlikely that any of them would smack into another nucleus. Neutrons are tiny compared to the gaps between the atoms. Far more likely the neutrons would fly out of the uranium as radiation. However, if you had enough uranium in the same place, and it was this special uranium-235 that you had separated off out of the uranium-238, then something interesting would start to happen. Because every time one neutron hit into a uranium, three more neutrons would be released. And if you had enough uranium, so that neutron had to fly past enough nuclei before it left, well, you could start to get it where it would be likely that these neutrons would hit other uranium nuclei. And in doing so, they would then create more reactions. Those reactions would then create three more neutrons which would smack into more uranium and so on and so forth. And you would have created what we call a chain reaction. A chain reaction is defined as when the odds of a induced fission creating another are greater than one. Think of it as similar to the R number that we talk about in infection control with coronavirus. If this number is lower than one, well, for if we had 100 induced fissions, they would create, say, 90 and then 81 and so on and so forth. However, if the number is greater than one, for each decay, if you're creating even slightly more than one extra decay on top of that, well, it's clearly just going to exponential off to infinity. And suddenly it all explodes. Now, if we think carefully about the geometry of critical mass, it's all about those neutrons flying through that empty space. 
So critical mass isn't just a quantity of uranium, it's also a shape of uranium. If you imagine you've got uranium-235 and made a really thin sheet of it, well, you could have as much as you wanted because the neutrons are all flying out in random directions and it's never going to be possible to get that number above one. In fact, when we want to create one of these chain reactions, what we really want is a ball, a sphere of uranium, because that will be the most efficient way to create these chain reactions and these extra induced fissions. So, all we need to do is take two pieces of subcritical uranium, two half spheres of it, and push them together. When we push them together, we'll have now created critical mass. This number will get above one, it will fly off to infinity, and it will explode. This, in its essence, is all an atomic bomb is. It's two half spheres of uranium with some dynamite next to it. The dynamite goes off and smashes them together, keeping them together for the fractions of a second it needs for this to occur. And of course, the stronger you knock them together, the more reactions are going to happen before momentum flies it out again. And kablamo, you've just knocked out a city. This is how it all works at a very fundamental level. We can only do it with uranium-235, and we need this odds to be greater than one for it to scale off to infinity. We can see this all at work inside a nuclear power plant. So, a nuclear power plant uses this fun fact about uranium-235 to create energy. A nuclear power plant works in exactly the same way that any other power plant works. If we imagine a coal power plant, we've got some coal burning, some water, the steam goes off, goes through a turbine, and you've got electricity. It's just basically a kettle. That's all like 95% of power plants are. They're just a kettle. Well, in a nuclear power plant, instead of burning coal, what we're going to do is we are going to have a chamber with water inside it. And this water is going to be heated by induced fission of uranium-235 molecules. As they're splitting, creating a chain reaction, they're going to heat up that water, and then we can use that hot water to make steam and spin our turbine. The water does two interesting roles. Firstly, it's the thing we're going to be heating up to spin our turbine, but also the water keeps the neutrons at just the right speed so that they're more likely to fission, meaning you can do the whole thing with less uranium. Turns out there's a, there's a speed that nuclei like to accept for the neutrons, which is unsurprising. We're at the quantum level. All the energies are quantized, so things need to be pretty specific for stuff to happen. We call this water a moderator as a result, because it moderates the speed of those electrons, makes sure they're going just right so they can smack into those uranium nuclei and keep our induced fission going. However, it would be bad, to say the least, if we created a chain reaction, went off to infinity. We want to keep that number around 0.9-ish. 0.9, 0.95, close to 1, so the reaction's going to keep going, but not above 1, because then, kablam. How do we do this? The answer is something you may have heard of. They are control rods. Control rods are very, very carefully engineered pieces of graphite, and other metals, which soak up neutrons. And you can lower them or raise them in or out of the water to suck up those neutrons which are flying about inside it. The lower the control rods are, the more of the control rods are in the water, the more they're going to soak up those neutrons. The higher they are, the more, less they are, and the more we're going to move that number up and down. So by carefully monitoring how much energy is coming out, we can track what that number is, we can think about how close to a chain reaction we are, and we can move the control rods up and down. The control rods are being bombarded with neutrons, and they're actually very cleverly designed 
So there's a mixture of materials that can accept neutrons at different speeds. So they're not just one material. There are a whole bunch that can soak up all the different neutrons. They get bombarded hard, and the nuclei of those control rods get shredded. When we're talking about disposal of nuclear waste, the control rods are actually one of the most important things, because it is the control rods that are often the most radioactive things which are created inside a nuclear power plant. They've just been pummeled by neutrons, and those nuclei have turned into all sorts of wacky different things with horribly short half-lives. So the control rods themselves become extremely radioactive and also can only accept so many neutrons before they need to be replaced. So disposal of control rods is a big part of looking after our power plants. So we've got our uranium-235 pinging around in here. The moderator, which is the water, is going to slow things down. And then there's two different ways of designing it, but the most common is interesting. You actually run a pipe with water through the incredibly hot water that is your moderator, and then it is that water that turns into steam, spins your turbine. So it's a very strange system where you have a pipe with water in it going through your other water. But that makes sense because we don't want this water to get full of neutrons, get messed up. We just want it to take in that heat energy, turn into steam, and spin our turbine. So, U235, induced fission, keep the number just under one, keep it ticking along, raise and lower our control rods, moderator, which is the water here, keeps the neutrons at the right speed, and then this other water here, which has the interesting name of coolant, because it is taking heat out of that, it is making things cooler, that's what we siphon off and turn into our steam. And if you've ever seen those massive chimneys, at nuclear power plants, it's the steam escaping having been through the turbine that you're seeing. So it's not actually pollution at all. Uh, they don't produce any carbon dioxide. Uh, they do produce horrible nuclear waste, however, which is going to be the subject of the next video.